you know, in our church, we've been going through the mission driven man. And last night we had our second session for the mission driven man. And I was thinking last night into this morning, what is the mission for me as a man? What is the mission for our church? What is the mission for us as Christians? And I think that that mission is not only to know Jesus ourselves, which is vital, but it's also to make Jesus known to others, which is why this ministry of Men's Discipleship Network is so good and so important because the mission of MDN is to really train men in the word of God. And it's to reach men and help them mature in the Lord so that we can do what? So that we can continue to go and raise up other disciples, starting first with our families. And so the mission, of course, is to know Christ, but it's also to make him known. But we need to be careful. You say, well, why do we got to be careful? Because we can miss the mission. And if you look at the word mission, you actually see the word miss in it. <laughs> you can miss the mission. I can miss the mission. We can make it about everything else except for what it's supposed to really be about. And um, if you take those last three letters of mission, you know, just to help us remember this morning, you have I-O-N. Now, maybe there are some uh, of those here that were really into science growing up, but an ion, what is that? An atom that can be either positively charged or it could be negatively charged. It can go either way. You can fulfill it or you can lose it. <laughs> so when you think of the mission today, if you miss it, you know, you're going to lose it. But you can fulfill the mission and God can do something really positive in your life and through your life, impacting the lives of those around you. Well, of course, we have an enemy. In fact, in session two of Mission Driven Man, we learn about those enemies. We learn about the enemy often of society coming against us. We learn about the enemy of ourself coming against ourselves, being our own worst enemy. And then we talked about the enemy of Satan himself. The enemy wants you to miss the mission. He wants you to fail. He wants those around you to fail. The more he gets you to fail, the less effective the mission will be. And so a lot of people think that, that you know, the enemy is just about knocking us down. And you're right. He does want to knock you down. But I think even greater than knocking you down in his mind is how long can he keep you down? The longer you are down, he knows the further removed you are from completing the mission that God has for your life. And he wants you as a man to miss the mission. I look at uh, the, the um, rates of success when you look at our society when they see a problem and they try to solve it, they try to often do so in a method that's not really going to work. We call it a Band-Aid, right? They put a lot of Band-Aids on in society today. And if you look at the mission success rate from a worldly perspective, there's still high rates of addiction. There's still high rates of fatherless households. There's still high rates of imprisonment. There's still high rates of illiteracy. There's still high rates of poverty. But when Jesus comes, he's able to, on that mission, make real changes in our lives. And I think about my family. My family was in poverty. Uh, my family was uneducated. Uh, as my parents came to Jesus, there was a change in their hearts. And that change in their hearts impacted every other area of their life. Because of Jesus, there was not one area of our lives that we did not see uh, exceed within our family, from education to finances to, to of course, uh, knowing the Lord and, and being called by him, everything. Have you found that to be true in your life? When Jesus comes, 
everything changes. Everything gets better than it was when Jesus comes. And so um, the success rate in the world is very different than the success rate with really knowing Jesus and having a true encounter with him. Every part of your life. I often hear that phrase holistic, right? Oh, a holistic approach. There's nothing more holistic than Jesus Christ. There's nothing more holistic than what he can do in you and he can do through you. And so if that's the truth, then we got to make sure we do not miss the mission. And so a big part of that mission, of course, it's knowing Jesus. And I think when we come out early on a Thursday morning or you're on Zoom early on a Thursday morning, you have a heart that wants to know God. That's great. That's a big part of the mission. But that next part is making him known to others. That's super important. In fact, I, I think to the degree that you're willing to let others know about Jesus is really evidence of how much you know him yourself. You really can't separate the two. If you're truly growing in Christ, you're also growing and sharing him with those that are around you. I was in the car with uh, some of my friends on the way here today. And uh, between the two churches represented in the group that I brought today, we together do something called Hope Day. A lot of you are involved in Hope Day in your churches, or you've heard MDN talk about Hope Day. Some of the guys who come here are, are leaders within Hope Day. Uh, you help to facilitate the food going out to the different churches uh, for Hope Day. A lot of the men here have volunteered to go to the warehouse and the churches and, and get all that food together for churches like ours that do Hope Day in our community. What is the mission? It's to bring hope to people. That's the mission to bring the hope of Jesus Christ into the lives of those that are around us. The same Jesus who takes this holistic approach to reach us in every area of our life, we have experienced it and we now want to bring it to others. And so we hear amazing stories of God doing things in our churches because of days like Hope Days, because of the love God has given us for others and, and reaching out to them in what might seem like simple ways sometimes, but God does it and he uses it. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. This summer, we did a coffee house outside uh, every Friday night in our backyard at church. And we had one of our fellas go into a local coffee shop while he was going to buy coffee. And he said to the lady behind the register, man, you should come out. We do a coffee house every Friday night. We have some music. It's a nice time. Well, this young girl in her 20s comes out to coffee house. She did not know the Lord prior to coming out to our church. And as a result of just the friendliness of those who were at coffee house, she came back the next Friday and the next Friday. And then she thought, you know what? These guys are also here on Sunday morning. Let me come join them on a Sunday morning. And she came out on a Sunday and another Sunday, another Sunday. Now, the summer was just a few months ago. This young lady has given her heart to Jesus. Whenever the altar is open at church, you can find her at the altar seeking Jesus. She's actually, I, I see her. She has her Bible. She's highlighting all over her Bible, making notes in her Bible, putting sticky notes in her Bible. The Holy Spirit in our services has been so evident that as she's at the altar, you can see she is touching God. And when service is over, you can see that all over even her countenance. And so our church decided we were going to do some leadership training. We want to help raise up those who have a calling in their heart for the lost. And out of all the people we were praying about and thinking about, this young girl comes to my mind. And I say, well, Lord, people are going to think this is a little strange. She's so new to you. To invite her to a leadership training really goes against the grain of what we would do in our churches today. And um, I thought there may be some others who look at that and say, well, maybe that wasn't a good idea. I thought she would look at it and say, what are you talking about? Leadership training, right? And so I decided to wait because the way the Lord gave this to me was to invite those 
who have expressed a desire that they had a calling in their life. And if they've expressed that to me somewhere along the way, I would invite them to come out to this leadership training. And this young girl had not expressed that, but yet the Lord kept putting her on my heart. And so the Friday night before the first leadership training, there's an altar call. She's at the altar and I'm sitting in the front row. Soon as church is over, she sits next to me. She says, Pastor Gary, this is going to sound crazy, but I feel like the Lord is calling me to go to Bible college. Yes, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and so I was able to take that as an opportunity to invite her out to our leadership training where the goal is to just hold hands with people as the Lord is working in their lives to know which direction they should take uh, for ministry or for leadership. And so this is what the Lord is doing. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the mission is not just me knowing Jesus. The mission is helping other people know Jesus. And that's what we want to do as men within our households. Uh, sometimes just to give you a, a word of encouragement, even though we want to see that in our households, sometimes that ends up taking place in our house when we think bigger than our house. And as the Lord uses us to even reach those outside of our house, we will see that when you're about the father's business, he cares and is concerned about your life and your business and your family. And so we were able to reach this woman. I'll, I'll give you another story. Only about a month ago, a lady started coming to church and um, I, I did not know who she was. In fact, uh, maybe two weeks later, a, a friend of a friend says to me, oh, my friend started going to your church and she keeps raving about how God has done something tremendous in her life. And, and she's so excited about it that it's got me, this is the woman talking to me, it's got me opening up my Bible and starting to read it because she doesn't know the Lord either. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I'm not even sure who you're talking about, but I'm so glad God is doing something, right? And so I finally got to meet the lady who had been coming for only about three, four weeks. She came to the church and there was an evangelist there. There was a time at the altar. She responded, really wanted to surrender her life over to Jesus. And she knew in that morning, God had done something in her heart. And so she's sharing her testimony with me just three weeks later. She said, Pastor Gary, I was heavily involved in the new age movement. She said, I had every book and every podcast. I was teaching yoga. I was becoming more well-known in our community in this group. And then I came out to church and met Jesus. She said, just a few months earlier, I was listening to a podcast of a famous woman who's a leader in New Age. And out of nowhere on her podcast, this woman says, I got to let you guys know something. I've given my life to Jesus. She said when she heard that, she felt so disappointed and let down by, by what that woman was saying because she had been following this woman for years. But the Lord used that as a seed in her heart that when she came to church and experienced Jesus, she recognized something greater than anything else she had experienced before. She saw the truth. She saw the way. She saw the life. And she wanted it. And she opened her heart. And she received it. And she went home and threw out all of her New Age books, got rid of all of her New Age podcasts. And in about two weeks, she's going to be baptized. Hallelujah. God is good. And there's nothing more exciting than that. And you've heard me say it before. People sometimes say, well, Pastor Gary, you're passionate about this because you're a pastor. <laughs> you're excited about this because you're a pastor. And for years, I, I, I thought about that when people would say that. And, and finally, I came to a place where I said, you know what? No, I'm not excited about this because I'm a pastor. I'm excited about this because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian with a mission that God has given me. And you too are a Christian with a mission that God has given to you to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, making disciples and baptizing. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So real quick this morning, uh, for those of you who are on Zoom as well, of course, how do we miss the mission? Because we want to make sure we're not missing the mission. Number one way that we miss the mission is focusing too much on ourselves. Man, that's an easy way to miss the mission. You have to remember something. 
you have the hope. You've experienced the hope. You know the way. You know the truth. You know the life. It's time to focus our emotion, our energy, our efforts on those who do not have hope yet. And if I've learned anything in this Christian walk, I've learned that when you set your heart on the mission and you try to help others, your problems and your issues somehow seem to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But when you want to focus on them, they seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the greatest way we're going to miss the mission is to only focus on ourselves. You know, America is a very, very generous country. All the statistics show that. But if you think about it, most of us have, as Americans give out of our abundance. We don't necessarily give out of true sacrifice. Even in our giving, we're still concerned with self. And so God wants to get us to a place where we're willing to put others ahead of ourselves, And you know you're doing that when it actually costs you something, really costs you something, where it's a sacrificially giving of your time, your energy, maybe even to a degree, your finances. What does the Bible say? Jesus say, right? If you have one, uh, two coats, give one <laughs> a coat. Man, we just got out our winter coats. Anyone else get your winter coats out? I don't know, three large black garbage bags of winter coats. I mean, enough coats to, 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 to help keep a community warm. I have in my closet, right? And yet the Bible says, if you have two, give one away. And there's excess, you know, in our country. There's, there, there's being so comfortable uh, in our country. And we're not willing really to sacrifice. We don't want to sacrifice our feelings for others. We don't want to sacrifice our comfort for others. We don't want to sacrifice what we think might be our future for others. And yet the future that God really has for us is to fulfill the mission that he's called us to fulfill. And if we're not doing that, we won't be fulfilled on the inside either. And so one way we miss the mission is to focus on self. Another way we miss the mission is not only focusing on self, but we focus on less important things. It doesn't mean they're bad things. It just means they're less important. And the Lord knows that there are things that we have to do in order to survive in the society that we are living in. So I'm not saying do not do those things, but what do we often say? If you take a good thing and make it a God thing, you've turned it effectively into a bad thing. And so we need to be careful not to miss the mission by focusing on less important things. Set your heart on what matters most. The Bible says where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And I'm here to remind you, people matter to God. People matter to God. And sometimes we get stuck on the methods and we're forgetting that it's really about the people. It's about the people. And I think Jesus blew that thought out of the water. He cared about people, even himself, seemed to go against what people would call God's methods. It's funny how they're deciding what God's methods are as if God in flesh can't do what he wants, right? Putting him in a box. Imagine that. The scribes, the Pharisees, even the disciples trying to put Jesus in a box. Don't talk to this one. Don't go here. Don't do that. Telling God what to do. Anyone could say, mm, I think maybe I'm guilty of telling God what to do. <laughs> I think I'm guilty of telling God what to do. It's not the methods necessarily. It's about the people. And God sometimes will go through some extreme methods to reach one person. I've seen him do it. And thank, thankfully he does. And what is holding you back from following his lead if it seems a little different or it seems a little odd. Um, oftentimes it's those things we don't wanna sacrifice. And if we boil it down to one word, it, it's ultimately pride. Well, what will they say? What will they think? <laughs> and yet if you do what God's called you to do and reach someone, you know, you get to share in the joy of that person coming to Christ and there's nothing greater 
than the joy of seeing someone's life transform and know that God let you be a part of that, if even in a small way. Man, that's how you know that's the mission. That's how you know it's the mission. Hallelujah. Another way, and the last one that you missed the mission, and we learned this last night in chapter two, session two of the Mission Driven Man at our church, it's focusing on the enemy. You can miss the mission by focusing on the enemy. Life is difficult. We can see in our world today that sin is rampant. Uh, the devil has a great foothold in many areas of our world. But guess what? God promises victory. There is victory in Jesus. And we're focusing too often on the enemy. And there are too many Christians that are fearful of what the enemy can do to them. Meanwhile, we're the ones who are arming the enemy. He's been disarmed because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and rising from the dead three days later. And we do not want to rearm the enemy. Um, the enemy is too much for, for Gary Petrillo, but he is not too much for Jesus Christ. And so it's important to realize that if we are in Christ Jesus, we do not need to focus on the enemy. We need to focus on the victory, the promises, and the mission that God has for us. You know what's comforting to me? God wouldn't lead a failed mission. God wouldn't lead a failed mission. And so if, if, if God's leading it, you know there is victory in it. If God is leading it, there is victory in it. And so we need to always refocus back on the victor, not the enemy. We're not here to glorify the enemy. We're here to glorify Jesus himself. You know, Paul, he missed the mission for many years of his life until he was swept up in the mission by Jesus himself. We need to be swept up in the true mission of what we're called to do by Jesus himself. We need to be captivated by Jesus, heart, soul, mind, to be sold out for the mission to bring hope that he came to bring into this world. Now imagine that. Here you have Paul, before being Paul, Saul, missing the mission, making it about everything but Jesus, right? Literally kicking against Jesus and his mission, thinking he was doing the right thing. And only after he has an encounter with Jesus does everything change in his life. To the point where 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, listen to what he was willing to go through. Listen to what became his experience, where you can see an obvious change in his heart and his mind and his life. He says in verse 23, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times, times without number and face death again and again. Five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night, a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. I mean, just think about that for a second. 
because I know that our modern day Western Christianity, we're doing everything to avoid everything Paul just said. That's our goal. Our goal is to avoid everything Paul went through. And guess what we call that? Being a successful Christian. If you avoid all this, you think, we think that you're successful. In fact, if you knew someone going through all this, you might look at them or, or others may look at you and say, you must be doing something wrong. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> oh, what if I told you if you're not going through this, you might be doing something wrong? <laughs> if you're not going through at least some of this, you might be doing this wrong. And of course, we said it in point one, you missed the mission focusing on self. The truth is we're focusing way too much on self. And Paul, when he focused on others, he really went through it, didn't he? But yet, is there any who would say he didn't fulfill his mission? In fact, his mission had such great repercussions that we're talking about him right now. <laughs> we're talking about him right now. And by the way, um, Paul's life and his testimony of the cost of fulfilling the mission doesn't sound very different from Jesus's testimony of fulfilling the mission. Oh, okay, so Jesus had to go through it and Paul had to go through it. But no, we don't got to go through it. <laughs> Oftentimes, talking about the mission, if you want to get to it, you got to go through it. You got to go through it. And there's a cost. You know, you've heard those phrases before. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. <laughs> it'll cost you everything. It'll cost you everything. And the question is, men of God, are we sold out? For Jesus, are we sold out for his mission? Are we sold out for his will? Because if you look around you, the thought that something else or someone else is going to change what's happening around us is, is, is misguided and it's naive. The only way we're going to see true change around us is by men fulfilling the mission that God has called us to fulfill. And I, every time I say that, I'm looking back above, above Joe because he has the sign right there. The mission-driven man. The mission-driven man. And, you know, it's not a contrived heart to fulfill the mission. This is not something that I think you or I could generate even in our own power. The heart to fulfill the mission comes from God himself. And the only way to get that heart is to get Jesus, to get more of the Lord, to get the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. I think about my dad, and I know I've shared my testimony with you guys over the last couple of years several times, but my dad, you know, was in and out of bars. My dad was uh, filled with a lot of rage and anger, and he was known as a bar fighter. They called him Crazy Gary in our community. And when he found Jesus, there was a complete shift in his heart, a complete shift in his mind, a complete shift in his spirit. There, he was always rough around the edges. He really was, always. But there was a major change and shift in his life. He had found something that he had been longing for, that once he had it, he was not going to let it go. He had had something and experienced something that once he had it, he knew it was so good that he had to have more of it. And not only for him, but he wanted to share it with others. Do you know every time the church was open, he was there. There was a hunger. There was a thirsting. I told you the story about the, the, the young girl who saved only a few months and wants to go to Bible college. I told you the story of the, the young woman. She, she uh, gave up this new age life. Do you know what she told me a week ago? Her boyfriend, who is the father of their one-year-old daughter, they live together, told her, I don't want you living here anymore. 
And she came to me crying last week. Well, she came to me this week. She said, God has helped me. You guys have been praying for me and reaching out to me. And God has helped me to make peace with my decision. I know I've done the right thing following Christ. And whatever happens, happens. What would make a young girl leave everything and want to go to Bible college? And what would make a, a young mom leave everything, including potentially her boyfriend and the father of her daughter, for Jesus? What would make that happen? A true encounter with Jesus. That's what's going to make that happen. And what did the disciples do? They left everything and they followed him. And if we think we're going to fulfill the mission or be fulfilled by not leaving everything, by not following him, or by leaving some things, but holding on to as much as we can carry while we're trying to walk the mission or saying to him, well, Lord, I'll walk the mission today, but tomorrow I'm on my own mission. And we think we're going to be fulfilled and we think we're going to be satisfied and we think we're going to be effective. We're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Have you found that out yet? It's all or nothing with Jesus. It's all or nothing. We have to be sold out for Jesus, sold out for Jesus. And what's amazing to me is with, with all that Paul went through, you don't hear him regret what he's doing. And so we have so deceived ourselves, we think that if we go down this sold out life with Jesus, we're going to be missing something. We're going to somehow come to the end of our life. And, we're, you know, I haven't met one person who was sold out for Jesus who at their end of their life regretted it. I haven't met one. But I've met a lot of people and have been at the side of a lot of deathbeds and have been to a lot of funerals. And I've met a lot of people who were severely disappointed because they realized they did not live their life for Christ. Sold out like they should have. And so this morning, gentlemen, I just want to help us remember what the mission is, who's put you on this mission, how important this mission is, and what it will do for not only those around you, but ultimately it will do for your own heart and your own life and your own family. You know, I, I love my kids. I have five of them. My oldest is 12 and my youngest is four. And so we have a pretty busy, hectic household. So when Pastor Scott on a Thursday morning says, oh, is Pastor Gary there? You know, I, I'd like to hear him say something. Literally, usually, when the minute he's saying that, it's at like the worst possible second <laughs> of my morning. I'm running with five kids trying to get, they're doing construction on my block. So I got to walk full block just to get to my car. And the other day, I'm going up the block with them yelling at them because there's construction trucks and everything yeah and i hear pastor scott on my phone just get asked to gary have anything to say oh man one time it was pouring rain and i'm trying to get in my car with the five kids and i hear it's like pastor gary <laughs> you to say? i love it i love it <laughs> i love it well that's one of the reasons why it's been a little tougher for us you know in this season uh, to get out here on Thursday morning since you started a few weeks ago. But I got to say, it's really good to see you guys here in person. You know? And we thank God for the technology of Zoom and, and the men who are on here with us uh, this morning as well, of course. We love you guys. And I love my kids. I love them. I love them. I love them. And I was on um, at the soccer field not too long ago, and Gary, my second oldest, 10 years old about, was playing soccer. And he got, pretty hit, he got hit pretty hard and was laid out on the ground. And, you know, I, it, he didn't move for a second or two. And I got to tell you, in that second or two, I got really, really scared and really nervous. Um, and, and it's because I love him, you know, and, and, I, and I value him. Um, in our community not too long ago and, and closer to where Austin's church is, again, we do Hope Day together. And um, it turned out, that when we did Hope Day this year, that night, there was a boy, I think about 10, 11 years old, who was shot and killed just a couple of blocks away from where we did Hope Day. And um, I remember thinking about Gary on the soccer field getting hurt and how worried I was. He ended up being perfectly fine. 
And then I later had to think about this boy's parents and what they must be going through after their son being shot and killed uh, through, through a bullet that wasn't meant for him at 10, 11 years old. And, you know, we see all this type of stuff happening in our world around us. And um, we need to get back to the mission. We need to get back to the mission. Uh, the only help for our society and, and for our cities is, is not necessarily who the mayor is, although I know that's important. It's not necessarily in, as important as who the governor is or who the senator is or who the congressman or woman is or who the president even is or who's leading the UN, right? The, the thing that's gonna make the most difference is who's the king of your heart? Yes. Yes. Who's the king of your heart? And you're not going to be able to pass the buck to some guy you vote for to do the job that God's called you to do. It just doesn't work that way. And plus, we're looking for, for, for imperfect people to somehow do the mission that God has called us to do as his church, empowered by himself and by his Holy Spirit and by his word and by even the fellowship of believers. And so we got to get back to the mission we got to get back to the heart. We got to get back and, and recognize that in ways we've been missing the mission. And we got to repent of that. And we got to say, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. I don't want to miss the mark. I don't want to miss the mission. You know, this idea of sin in our minds almost always, it's making sure that we don't do something that God said not to do. That's how we look at sin. Don't mess up, Gary. We think messing up is doing what he said not to do. But did you know that sin is also not doing what he said to do? It's only do not do this. And if you break that, you're sinning. If he calls you to do something and you don't do it, that is sin just as much as looking at it the other way. Sinning, we all know, is to miss the mark. If we are missing the mission, we're missing the mark, and that's a sin. And in our Western culture and America today, we'd be lying if we thought we were doing such a great job fulfilling the mission. I, I, don't, I don't think we are. I think this time in the last couple of years has been pretty hard evidence against the church that we're not doing such a great job on the mission that God has called us to do. But I got great news for you, men. Great news for you. One man who sold out for Jesus can see God use them to make a difference in the lives of people right around them. Right. One man. We see that in Paul. We see that in Jesus. I can look at my own life and say, I saw that in my dad. I saw that in my dad. You know, he started House on the Rock Church 26 years ago in the same neighborhood that he used to run around like crazy Gary, get into bar fights. In fact, our church during COVID purchased the first building we own during COVID. For a hundred plus years, the building was always a bar. And everyone now tells me, you know, your dad used to come to this bar before he knew Christ. Can you imagine he's in heaven now, knowing that the mission that God put him on to start so lit a fire in the lives of others that even while he's not here, we're still fulfilling the mission and have taken a bar and have turned it into a church. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. And so one man sold out for Jesus can make a difference. But, you know, the disciples, 12 of them, they really were able to make a huge difference, a citywide difference a countrywide difference, a worldwide difference. And here we are this morning with, with a dozen or more in person and a dozen or more on Zoom. And God can use us to make a difference, to make a difference. And so the last thing I'll leave you with this morning is an old hymn. And uh, those of you who know me know I grew up in a church that only sang hymns. And so I love, I love uh, the lyrics and, and some of the melodies of uh, many hymns. Some of them are a little more obscure than others. Uh, but this one 
is one that from childhood has always been one that, that I said, Lord, give me this heart, give me this heart to, to pray this and, and say this and, and do this with every part of my life. The verse says, oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. Oh, let me hear thee speaking in accents clear and still. Above the storms of passion, the murmurs of self-will. Oh, speak to reassure me, to hasten or control. Oh, speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. Oh, Jesus, thou hast promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. Oh, let me see thy footmarks and in them plant mine own. My hope to follow duly is in thy strength alone. Oh, guide me, call me, draw me, uphold me to the end, and then to rest receive me, my Savior and my friend. Let's pray together. Uh, that the, that we would really that the Lord would do what only He can do. You know, um, we need the Lord, the Holy Spirit. We really do. <laughs> oh Jesus, Hallelujah! Come on, let's let's get in tune with Him even now before we pray in closing. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. If you're on Zoom right now in your room or your living room or your dining room, wherever you are, oh, just allow your heart to get in tune with the heart of Christ right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in us, Lord. Call us, draw us. Oh, Jesus, soften us, oh God. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, God, we come to you this morning knowing that we are not the answer knowing that we do not have the strength. Lord, we're not the way, we're not the truth, we're not the life, but we need the way. We need the truth, we need the life, we need the answer. This world needs the answer. Our families need the answer. And Jesus, we confess and we declare and proclaim, you are the answer. You are the answer for the world today. You are the answer to all my longings and to all my questions. And you're the answer to the needs of my family, oh God. You are the answer. And so, God, we humbly come before you today. We repent for making the answer everything else, for trying to squeeze the answer out of something that isn't the answer. Oh, God, it's you. It always has been you, and it always will be you, Jesus. Open our eyes, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would take the veil, oh God, off of our spiritual eyes, Lord, that, that our spiritual ears would be unplugged this morning. God, we would understand who it is who's called us to such a great mission, how important this mission is to your heart, that you give your only son, oh God, to take our place so that this mission could be fulfilled in the lives of many for all eternity. Oh, Jesus, what matters to you, Lord, let it matter to us. What breaks your heart, let it break our heart. What gives you joy, let it give us joy. Oh, God, Lord, we, we, we ask, Lord, that you would help us die to self. Lord, that we would die to flesh. That it would not only be us trying to satisfy ourselves, but, Lord, may it be bringing pleasure and glory 
to your name and to you. Oh, we bow before you this morning. We worship you for who you are, oh God. And we ask, Lord, that this work that we know we need, Lord, we ask that you would come and do it in a powerful way, in a transformative way, in a way, Lord, where there's no turning back. Lord, we want to be sold out for you. Could you do that, Lord, in us? Lord, if there's a prayer that you can answer, Lord, that your heart would desire to answer, Lord, help us to be sold out for you, sold out for you, withholding nothing withholding nothing. I give you all of me. Oh, can you declare that to the Lord today? I give you all of me. I give you all of me for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Wow. Amen. Wow. Let me turn it over to Coach Joe. Thank you, sir. Wow. Give the pastor a hand. Even on Zoom, give him a hand. Come on, man. Thank you, Pastor. I know you spoke to a lot of men's hearts because I've been reading the chat box for the last half hour and you brought mission out in a whole new realm. And I know you blessed a lot of men out there. Um, we're going to do offering now. I'm going to hand it over to Carlos. I'm going to hand it live over to Brother Artie, if you don't mind. We have a basket in the back. And uh, Carlos, it's all yours, brother. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what, what a message, and uh, thank you, Pastor Gary. Uh, I won't say as usual, but I will say that. You know, his heart, his passion, and his message, and and the hymn, and the prayer, and uh, so much, it's, it's, it's incredible. And uh, he is such a blessing to the ministry, and, and I want to just thank him for this morning, uh, for God working through him. Uh, wow. Uh, very great it was great so uh, but anyway my task this morning uh is to is to take up an offering for the ministry and uh you know bless you men that are there physically and uh, if you pass the basket around i'm sure uh you see on the screen there are uh, three ways that we can give and talking to the men on zoom uh to the men that are physically at the warehouse um you can go online uh, to mensdiscipleshipnetwork.com and follow the instructions for donation. Uh, you can use your smartphone and text the, uh, put in the number and then uh, text in the word give, uh, or you can write a check. Okay, you can write a check and uh, uh, send it to uh, Men's Discipleship Network at 27 Grand Avenue in Farmingdale, New York. When you see the address in the right corner, uh, and at the end of this uh, session, each of us will receive uh, an email, and you can just click on the box and uh, donate that way. Uh, and as one thing I mention each and every week, you can also give monthly. Uh, you can uh, become a, a member of MDN, and uh, you can, if you so desire, choose to give monthly and uh, designate your gift. Your gift can be to the ministry itself. It can be for mission-driven man. Uh, it can also be for Pastor Scott and uh, his lovely wife, Debbie. So I, I want to leave you with that. And uh, again, thank you, Pastor Gary. What a blessing this morning you were. Uh, and uh, incredible, incredible. Thank you.